At this time, I encourage you, if you have your Bible with you, start turning with me to the book of Galatians. We'll be continuing in our study. We're going to look at chapter, 10, uh, chapter 2 of Galatians, verses 1 through 10. And as you're turning there, I will tell you that uh, <laughs> this is going to be kind of a sermon and a half because uh, what we're going to cover there's a portion of it and that's actually the beginning portion that I don't want to get into too much of the background of what's going on because it's brought up again in a later portion of Galatians and my prayer is that we'll focus on it wholeheartedly then uh, but we are going to look at uh, kind of what's going on as to why Paul is once again writing this letter uh, but before we do that, I, I felt it necessary to, to kind of address who is with Paul, address what's going on in regards to why he is writing this, and then, Lord willing, we'll get to uh, the entirety of the second portion of our text, which is, is going to be our main focus. But I want to start, of course, verse 1 of Galatians chapter 2. This is, uh, and I've entitled this, the Jerusalem Council, because it is referencing the time in which Paul and several of his uh, companions travel to Jerusalem. This is a retelling of that event in which uh, certain things were debated by the disciples and discussed by the disciples, and this kind of gives us the reason as to why they mainly met together. Verse 1 it says, Then fourteen years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Verse 5, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seem to be somewhat Whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. For they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effect, uh, effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. So there's a lot of, especially in the King James, some lofty wording here, and we're going to get to that in a moment. But essentially what we have to understand is this is a reference likely to the event in which Paul and several of his, his companions go to Jerusalem to what we refer to as the Jerusalem Council. We see this in Galatians 2.1. He says after 14 years, uh, we remember in chapter 1 he had talked about his conversion, he had talked about the fact that he went into uh, Arabia and he was in Damascus, then he went down to Jerusalem. It says, then 14 years later, so between chapter 1 and this verse, we must understand that several of his missionary journeys have taken place. He's saying, 14 years have gone by, I went back to Jerusalem, and he brings two people that he mentions with him. There are probably more than just two people, because Acts says that... Uh, Paul and Barnabas went and several others. Titus was one of those several others. But I want us to kind of get to know these two individuals before we go any further because 
Paul mentions them purposely. Notice he mentions Barnabas. If you read through uh, the book of Acts, you'll probably notice that Barnabas is mentioned in league with Paul constantly. You might read scriptures, Paul and Barnabas, and you're going to read that a lot throughout the book of Acts. But Barnabas was a very close friend and a very loved friend of Paul. Acts chapter 4 tells us a little bit more about his backstory. Barnabas was there in the early church. He was there even prior to Paul's conversion. Acts 4 verses 36 and 37, the scripture says, And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, so Barnabas, his name is really Joseph, but everybody calls him Barnabas, uh, which is interpreted the reason they call him Barnabas is because that's more of a nickname it means the son of consolation or the son of encouragement so what we're to understand is Barnabas is a very encouraging person and I would imagine Paul would want to surround himself with people like that all that Paul goes through he needs encouragement and then obviously Barnabas is that person in his life it says Barnabas was a Levite and of the country of Cyprus having land sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So Barnabas is there in the early church. He is, is spoken of here in a, a well way that he had land and he felt compelled to take that land to sell it and to give the money to the apostles and the early church. So we can imagine Barnabas was probably a, a well thought of individual. He's someone who is very loved by not only Paul, but many of the other church members in Jerusalem and the apostles. So this is one of the people who is with Paul, but he also mentions Titus. Now, you're probably also going to be familiar with that name because it's one of the books of the New Testament. Titus uh, 1, 4, and 5 tells us a little bit more about who he is. And the reason why Paul brings him up, we're going to get to in a moment, it's important. He's not just naming names uh, just to say, well, these people are with me as I'm writing. He, he brings Titus up very much so with a point. But in Titus 1, verses 4 through 5, Paul writes to Titus and tells us this about the individual. It says, to Titus, mine own son after the common faith grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou should set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. Now what we're going to notice here is, he starts by saying, to my own son, after the common faith. That's to lead us to believe that Titus is likely a, a convert. He has become a Christian as a result of Paul's personal ministry. Paul uh, likely led Titus to Christ by preaching the gospel. He ultimately pointed Titus to the person of Jesus Christ uh, personally. This is uh, very much so why he would have called him his own son after the common faith. So he probably sees Titus as um, a younger man that he's able to mentor, a younger man that he's able to teach the scriptures. Now, Titus is, as we see in this scripture, he is left in Crete. Paul placed great faith in Titus to leave him on the Isle of Crete. During this time and uh, during Greek times, Crete was a I would say a very pagan area. It was a, an island that was somewhat secluded from the rest of the world in many ways, not just physically, but they had their own way of doing things. They had their own cultures. And Paul ultimately leaves Titus there in Crete for the purpose of building the church in this country. He tells us in verse 5 that he left Titus in Crete so that he would ordain elders in every city. So he's given to Titus the ministry of now going out into the island of Crete 
and making his own disciples, uh, making disciples of Christ there in Crete so that they might become pastors. So uh, Titus is, again, someone who is very, I would say, important to Paul in that he is willing to leave him on his own in Crete to do this ministry. Paul likely had a great trust in Titus. Now, Titus is also uh, something that we need to know about him. He's not a Jew or he's not from a Jewish background like Barnabas or Paul were. Notice if you look back to our main text, Galatians 2, 3 through 4, it tells us that, uh, verse 3, but neither Titus, who was with me being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So, first of all, Titus is a Gentile. Titus does not have, from what we would understand, a Jewish upbringing. He doesn't know the Old Testament scriptures very likely. Uh, But he comes in contact with Paul, who preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it tells us that he was, uh, we see, he wasn't compelled to be circumcised. And that is kind of what is going on here. That's the reason Paul goes back to Jerusalem 14 years later. The Jerusalem Council was all about this debate. Do Gentiles have to follow uh, certain Old Testament laws? Do Gentiles have to be uh, under, as we see in a little bit, the manner of Moses? Do the Gentiles have to be circumcised? And we see that Paul says in verse 3, Titus has heard the gospel. He knows Jesus Christ as his Lord, and he's not compelled to be circumcised. Verse 4 goes on to say that because there were false brethren who had unawares been brought in, meaning there were people who had entered into the church that were doing so not out of necessarily belief, because we are to understand these are false brethren, they are not actual believers, but they enter into the church. They uh, are able to subtly enter in, and they do so with the purpose of seeking to not only spy on the church, but they are wanting the church in Galatia to submit to the laws of Moses. They want to bring them back into bondage. We see this in Acts 15, 1 through 2. This is uh, foretold, and again, This is kind of that half sermon. I don't want to get too much into detail about the Jerusalem Council. I know it's the title of the sermon, but I don't want to get too much into detail because Paul kind of circles back a few chapters from now, and we're going to get into great detail on this belief. But in Acts 15, 1 through 2, we do see uh, Paul is battling against this belief that is entering into the churches in Galatia. It says in verse 1 of Acts 15, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them, and this this is one of those phrases, this is including Titus. Uh, He is one of those other ones. So Paul, Titus, and Barnabas and several unnamed individuals, they are now going to Jerusalem to talk with the apostles and the elders about this situation. So that's what is going on here. We, we've kind of hit on it a little bit with the historical nature of Galatians, but we need to understand that this is why Paul feels it necessary to write to the church. But while he is in Jerusalem, this is what I want us to mainly focus on now. There's an occurrence that happens. Paul, while he's there debating against the Judaizers, debating against this belief that you have to be circumcised to become a believer, something also happens that he mentions in Galatians. And I want us to look at mainly that today. Galatians 2 verse 6. Notice what we see happens Uh, he says but of these who seem to be somewhat whatsoever they were it maketh no matter to me God accepteth no man's person for they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me now essentially what we have to understand is Paul is telling us here 
that he is preaching the gospel to the apostles, not because they need to know it. They know it very well. But Paul is preaching to them what he has been preaching to all of the Gentiles as a means to essentially put to rest any false rumors that Paul is preaching a different gospel or that Paul is preaching something that is unbiblical. He's essentially, I would say, he's, he's kind of getting, uh, I, I, I don't want to say he's getting their approval because I don't think Paul's doing that by any means, but he's, he's essentially saying, this is what I'm preaching. Is this any different than what you're preaching? Uh, and, and from time to time, I can tell you in my own life in ministry, pastors, we converse with one another and we converse on certain topics and, and certain scriptures. And we might say, you know, this is how I read this. What do you think about this? Am I wrong here? Is this something that I need to study more or, or is there something I'm missing? And I think that's what's essentially happening. Paul is, is going to the other disciples and the apostles in Jerusalem and saying, this is what I'm preaching. Uh, I, I would hope that this is what you are preaching. This is the message of Christ. Now, I want to point out here, he, he's very, uh, he's not subtle in what he says in verse 6. He says, but of these who seemed to be somewhat. Paul's basically saying there, there are those who, you know, I, I went to in Jerusalem and I was preaching the, the gospel to as a means to just verify that this is the same gospel they're preaching. He said that there were people there who, that phrase in the King James, who seemed to be somewhat. We would probably use a phrase, uh, phrase like they were uh, the big dog on campus. You know, they were the, the big man on campus. Everybody knew who this person was. When we think about this, he lists later on who some of these people were. They were James. They were Peter. Uh, they were part of that core group of the disciples that were with Christ. These were people that uh, the church would have looked up to, and uh, rightly so. They would have seen these people and seen what God had done through them. And they would have said, these are, and we might call them the church fathers. They are the big wigs, uh, the important people. But Paul makes a very important distinction here because many a times we in our own Christian culture, in church life, we might get caught up in this belief that there are, uh, and you can see it, especially in the Western church, celebrities within the church. Uh, there are many pastors or many ministers who are very well known and, and their ministries are far reaching. And we might be tempted to look at these people and say, they are perhaps more important in God's work. But Paul makes it clear, he says, there were those who seemed to be somewhat, there were those who were you know, high up in the eyes of the church. They were very important in the eyes of many. But he goes on to say, whatsoever they were, it matters not to me. Uh, and that's kind of Paul throwing, he's, he's not dissing them in a way, he's not putting them down, but he is saying, people might look at these apostles and, and say, well, they are more important in their ministry than I am in mine. Paul makes it clear, he says, in the eyes of God, everybody is equally loved. Everyone is equally valued. Uh, because notice what he goes on to say in verse 6, God accepteth no man's person. God doesn't look at the pastor who has the most in their congregation, the largest number, and say, they're more valuable than the pastor down the street who only has a few people. God doesn't look at uh, things the way we do. We might be tempted to look at someone in ministry and say they're more valuable because of their great work. But God looks at each of us and says, you're all valuable to me. God values us greatly. Acts 10, 
uh, speaks to this reality as well. Peter himself says, Acts 10, 34 and 35, listen to how Peter puts it. Verse 34 of Acts 10, then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. We are often tempted again to have celebrities in the church, people who are more well known. And, and no matter what we do, that's just going to be a reality. There are going to be pastors who are just more well known. There are going to be believers who are just better known to the church as a whole. However, just because they are more well known does not mean that their ministry is any more valuable than your ministry or my ministry. We ought to understand that if God calls us unto salvation, he calls us to do any deed, any work. If God calls us to do anything, have any calling placed upon us, that that is a valuable calling. And there is no one calling that is greater than another or more important than another. It might be greater in the sense that it is larger, but if God calls you to do something, I don't want you to ever think that it's less valuable than what God calls somebody else to do. Because if God calls you to do something, you ought to view that as this is important. Don't view it as it's not as important as, as everybody else is calling. It's not as valuable. If God has called you to any ministry, it's of great value. We ought to understand that scripture teaches that God is not a respecter of persons. He values each and every one of us and the calling he places on us equally. James 2, 8 through 9 speaks more to this uh, in, in regards to the fact that uh, this may seem out of place, but it, it regards it in the fact, I believe, that no matter what our ministry is, we ought to commit ourselves to doing it wholeheartedly, not thinking, well, it's not that important. Let somebody else do it. James 2, 8 through 9, it says, If ye fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. So if we look at anyone in the church and say, well, they're more important because A, B, and C, says this is not the case. God is not someone who looks at others and says, you're less valuable to me because I've placed a smaller calling on you. If you are in Christ, you are equally valued by Christ. Now, with that in mind, going back to Galatians 2, look at, at verses 7 through 9. Because Paul says there's, there's no one in the church who's more important than anyone else. Everyone is equally valuable. However... Just because we are equally valuable doesn't mean that we all have the same uh, tier of ministry. What God calls you to do may not be the same thing God calls someone else to do. What God puts on your heart to do may not be the same thing God puts on someone else's heart. And what I mean by that is specific callings. We'll look to that in just a moment. But Galatians 2, 7 through 9, let's know what Paul goes on to say. He says, but contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed to me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same way, uh, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And I'll pause there basically to clear it up. It, Paul's saying, they understood that, that God had called me to preach to the Gentiles and that God had effectually called Paul, uh, Peter to preach to the Jews. And uh, while these two ministries are separate, they're equally valuable. Verse 9 goes on to say, And when James, Cephas, meaning Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen and that they unto the circumcision. 
So they come to this conclusion and saying that they believe Paul has been given the calling to go to the Gentiles, the term used here, the heathen, to those who are not Jewish people. And Peter and, and several of the other disciples, they've been giving the calling to go to the Jews and to preach specifically to them. Now, these two are separate ministries, very much so, to preach to the Gentiles and to preach to the Jews. While they're preaching the same message, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the way that they go about doing so is probably very different. The way that the Jews saw the world and the way that the Gentiles saw the world was almost completely opposite. They had very different backgrounds, very different beliefs. But nonetheless, God called Paul to preach to the Gentiles and God called Peter to preach to the Jews. This, to me, is a reminder of the reality that God calls each and every one of us to do something for him, but it may not be the same exact thing. You might be called to be more of an encourager. You might be called to be more of uh, someone who is dedicated to pointing others to the word of God. Now we're all to do that in some extent, but there are many different gifts and many different talents that God gives. They're all varying and not the same. We can see this in places like 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12 uh, verses 4 through 6 tells us that God gives to his children very diverse callings and diverse gifts. They're not all the same. Notice verse 4 starts by saying, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operation, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. Meaning, God might give you a gift and someone else a different gift, but just because they're different gifts, it doesn't mean that they are either less of value. God has given each individual certain gifts or certain callings with the expectation or understanding that each of them is to use this gift for the glory of God above all else. Further on in the chapter, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 13, uh, 13 through 18, notice what Paul goes on to write. Now he goes on uh, in this, you may be familiar with it regarding the reality that oftentimes the church is called the body of Christ. Uh, we are the body of Christ in that he is the head, he is the one that is above us, and we are to do that which he commands us, just like the brain tells the hand to do a certain action and the hand does it. Christ is the one who commands us to work and we are to obey him. But the body is composed of very different things. We'll see that in this text. 1 Corinthians 12 verses 13 through 18. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Verse 14, notice what it says, for the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, and I love this, Paul <laughs> uses kind of this humorous idea. Imagine the body parts talking. He says, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. Basically he's saying, imagine, if you will, your foot starts talking and saying, I wish I was your hand. <laughs> as wild as that would be, you say, no, I need a foot. I need you to be what you are. Imagine if the ear said, I wish I could see instead of hear. 
Say, no, because if you saw, then I wouldn't be able to hear. And he uses that, that understanding. If the whole body was an eye, then you wouldn't be able to hear at all. The idea here is that we have all been given different gifts, different callings, different missions in life. And God expects us to be faithful in those things. We ought not to look at someone in the church who has a different calling or a different gift and say, I wish I was as gifted as them in this area instead of what I'm gifted in. I wish I was given their calling. We might be tempted to look at others. And I can tell you as a minister, I might be tempted to look at other pastors around the world and say, I wish I uh, had their calling. I wish that I was as well known as they are. I wish I was uh, able to do what this pastor is able to do. But instead of looking at it in that way, we're not to look at it out of jealousy or envy. We're to look at it. I heard once uh, several years ago that there was a pastor of a very small church. And every Sunday he would get caught up in traffic because just down the road from his very small church was a large church that had a large congregation and after the church service would be over as he's leaving his small church that large church is coming out of their parking lot and he gets stuck that pastor instead of saying I wish that I was pastor of that church or saying something of of very different I wish uh, that this was me instead of me being at this small church. It's, I'm told that the pastor thanked God, saying, even though I get stuck in this traffic from their large congregation and I have such a small congregation, I thank God that people are coming to church. It may not be my church, but thank God that they are, are praising the Lord. We need to be of that like mind. We need to say, I want to do what God's called me to do, not what God has called someone else to do. I don't want to be jealous of somebody else's calling. Paul and Peter were called to two very different callings. Paul was called to the Gentiles. Peter was called to the Jews. They could have looked at each other and perhaps been jealous of each other. They could have been envious of others and said, Paul could have looked at Peter and said, I'm better equipped to deal with the Jews. I have a a better understanding of the Old Testament scriptures than Peter. He was a fisherman, and I was basically a Pharisee. I should have Peter's calling. Peter could have looked at, at Paul in the same light and said, I wish that I didn't have to deal with the Jewish culture because being a fisherman, uh, Peter, he probably knew some of the Old Testament scriptures, but he wasn't as well learned. and. Perhaps he could relate to more outcasts like the Gentiles. He might have looked at Paul's ministry and said, I wish that God had called me to do that instead. But instead of doing these two things, they understood that God had called them to do what God had called each of them to do. And they did not envy one another's calling. Instead, they valued each other's ministries and said, God's called you to do this. Go do it. Do it well. God's called me to do this. I'm going to go do it and do it well. Why? Because in envying, in jealousy, if we ever look to someone's ministry and are jealous of it, it's only going to bring problems. James 3.16 makes it clear. James 3.16 tells us this exact truth. James is, is saying here, he says, For where envying and strife is, There's confusion and every evil work. So if you have jealousy or if you have envy, it's not going to bring about any good thing. It's not going to bring about any any goodness. It's only going to bring about that which is displeasing to God. This is why we see one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not covet. Coveting meaning we shouldn't yearn for that which is not our own. We should not look to somebody else and their life, and their calling, and say, I wish I could take their place. I wish that was me. But instead, we look to our own calling and say, God, 
Help me to do what you've called me to do. Now, regardless of all this, regardless of what your calling is, uh, if you're called to encourage, if you're called to teach, if you're called to uh, sing, whatever it may be, regardless of what God calls you to do, there is one certain thing that is pointed out here in Galatians 2 that we must all take part in. And that is in verse 10 of Galatians 2. Paul says that they determined that James, Peter, and John, they would preach to the Jews. Paul and his cohorts would preach to the Gentiles. But regardless of who they were called to preach to, they all ought to do this last thing. Verse 10, only that they would remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. Meaning, no matter what God calls us to do, we need to take care of those around us. We need to be mindful of those who are less fortunate, those who are in need. No matter who you're called to reach out to, no matter what you're called to do in this life, you need to remember that God has ultimately called us to love our neighbor as ourself. James 1.27 is very much so uh, the, the ultimate statement on this. James tells us this great truth. James 1.27. Pure religion, undefiled before God and the Father, is this. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. And to keep oneself unspotted from the world. James is saying here, this is what true faith looks like first of all we must love our neighbor we must visit the fatherless and the widow and that terminology fatherless and the widow that's often used just to be a, a general term as the poor the needy those who have needs of any kind true faith looks after those who cannot take care of themselves and of course true faith also as it says here seeks to keep itself unspotted from the world, to avoid sin. Those are the two great commandments. Now, in James, I'd say they're kind of in a backwards order. Uh, to keep oneself unspotted from the world, I would say that could be de defined as loving God. Loving God means avoiding and seeking to live a life void of sinfulness. But it also means loving our neighbor. I'll end with one last passage, and it's 1 John 3.17. It's a reminder to us that no matter what our ministry is, no matter what our calling, let us always remember that we need to take care of the needs of others. And this is exactly what Paul and Peter went on to do. 1 John 3.17, But whoso hath this world's good, good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels and compassion from him. How dwelleth the love of God in him? Doesn't matter what God has given you as a talent or as a calling. If you see someone in need and you have the means to take care of that need and you don't do it. That's a harsh phrase. How can the love of God dwell in that person? We need to understand how important it is that no matter what God calls us to do. Specifically, generally, he has called us to take care of the poor and needy. Let that be a part of our daily life as best as we are able. God calls us to many things. Let us not be envious of God's calling on someone else. But let us be thankful that God called us at all. That God would use us at all. And let us remember the poor and the needy. For this is what we are called to do regardless of what our specific calling is my prayer is that we remember that let's not be jealous of one another's gifts or talents but let us be thankful that God has called us to what ministries called us to and let's be faithful to do it making sure not to ignore the needs of those around us with that let us pray